so happy to be here. Um, like always, our earliest memory of ourselves is always a story our parents tell us about ourselves. My earliest memory is a story my mom keeps telling me about when I was young, how obsessed I was with the Discovery Channel. I would just spend all my time watching animals and watching all sorts of wildlife on TV. Now that kind of started my passion for biology, but that passion or the Discovery Channel was not enough. Something, had, something bigger had to happen after that. I was lucky that my biology teacher in school, Mr. Bassam, spotted that passion in me as a young kid, and he fueled it 10 times over. He used to take me to the lab to learn all about microscopes, and he would show me cells and show me animals, and that kind of fueled my passion even more for biology. Now, you would imagine, after being so passionate about biology, I found myself going into uh, medicine. And inside my, inside my experience during my medical school, I started caring more about the brain, but more so about mental health. After I graduated from medical school, I started working with children on the autism spectrum and working with adults that have anxiety. I spent most of my time starting, trying to understand mental health and understand its impact on people's lives. Now, this is where things started to come together. I started realizing that my passion for biology and my love for biology was actually helping me in understand mental health on a deeper level. My passion for biology was always giving me insight and ideas on how I can actually help my patients even more. And that started my journey as an adult. I started creating a company, an organization, that its main goal would be to bring biology, bring concepts in biology, and teach people how the concepts in biology or the concepts in neuroscience can reshape people's understanding of mental health. And that's what I do right now. I teach organizations and I teach universities and I work with corporations. And I usually bring that science, these novel ideas in science, in biology particularly, and I try to see how these ideas can reshape the way we see our own mental health. And that has been my journey for the most part. And I believe today what I want to do, what I aim to do, is present to you five ideas from biology. Five ideas from modern science and biology that I believe if you take the time to understand or conceptualize or look at, those ideas have the power to reshape your own understanding of mental health. So I would like to start the journey. Each topic is a huge topic, so we're not going to spend most of our time on each topic, but I'd rather give you the core issues, the core concepts in each biological point and see how that could translate to shaping or reshaping your own understanding of mental health. Concept number one. Immunology, your immune system. You will never look at your mental health the same way if you knew about the relationship between your mental health and the immune system. Now, modern psychiatry and modern research spends a lot of its time working and structuring its research on what could go wrong in mental health. What could go wrong in mental health? That is studying negative psychological experiences and how these negative psychological experiences have negative biological consequences. We all know when somebody is experiencing a negative psychological experience for a, a prolonged period of time, the body, the mind starts releasing these stress hormones, these stress chemicals, and these stress chemicals have been studied and proven to increase inflammation in the body, to increase atherosclerosis and heart disease, to increase even or decrease even the life expectancy of people. Now, we all know about that. We all know that stress and, and, and chronic anxiety and chronic depression has negative biological impact. But only recently, researchers and biologists have been shaping and shifting their attention from negative psychological experiences into positive psychological experiences. And it is only in our understanding of positive psychological experiences that we are able to understand positive psychology in a new light. Now, most people think that positivity is some trend on social media. But what I'm trying to say is that positivity is a trend in biochemistry itself. That when you are experiencing positive emotions, you are also bringing a positive biological impact to your body. So in one of the very interesting researches I read, they put people in a laughing uh, kind of meditation. They were laughing for four hours in an experiment. And after four hours of laughing, they realized that a natural killer cell, a cell in the immune system in the body, started to be elevated. The same thing happened when people went into deep meditation and breathing. Suddenly, CD4 cells, cells that are very essential in fighting infection, started to increase in their levels. 
Well, the most fascinating one is maybe awe and wonder. It's the same thing you feel when you look at the Grand Canyon or when you watch a great TED Talk or when you meet a stranger for the first time. Wonder is a feeling, a positive feeling, a positive psychological feeling that can affect ourselves. And here it decreases interleukin-6, which is a pro-inflammatory cytokine. Two, another idea in biology that I think if you took the time to understand it, you would also reshape your understanding of mental health itself. We already know that the human brain is made out of the simple building blocks, which are the neurons. The neurons conglomerate together to form large networks, and those large networks in themselves execute the functions of the brain. So there is no really one location in the brain that does all the functions, but rather it is a group of networks that are arranged in different specific arrangements that execute different functions at different uh, levels of the brain, right? And from understanding that, uh, we can understand that now we know that in mental health, one specific network in the brain is extremely interesting for people who are trying to study mental health. That specific network is a network in the brain that connects two different parts of the brain. The first part is the amygdala. You can see it in red. That part of the brain is really responsible for um, heightened responses in fear, in stress, in anger while the blue part in the frontal cortex is a region in the brain responsible for more hierarchical, higher levels of brain function. So concentration, planning, emotional regulation. Now, what's interesting about the connection between these two um, uh, different locations in the brain is that these two have an interesting dynamic between them. One of them influences the behavior of the other. If the amygdala fires, the other one sh shuts down or lowers down. And if the other one starts firing, the other one calms down and slows down. So what is interesting about that, and if you knew that, you would really begin to realize how important it is to learn about our emotions and to learn about how our brain processes emotions and how we can learn things like meditation and self-regulation and how that can really alter the structure of our brain. Another idea that is interesting in mental health, an idea that I think if you knew about it, it would also reshape your understanding, is epigenetics. Epigenetics explains an agency that is bigger than just our genes. It explains how we have one DNA sequence present in all the cells, but we have more than 200 different types of cells. So that means that we have one DNA, but the expression of that DNA is different in each every, and every cell. But epigenetics also explains a more interesting phenomena, like the phenomena of monozygotic or identical twins. What happens with identical twins is that identical twins share the same, 100% the same DNA when, they, when fertilization happens. So these are two babies that at the beginning of their journey, they share the same, 100% the same DNA sequence, yet, Epigenetics explains how each and every one of those kids would grow up to be completely different than the other. Epigenetics is an idea that explains how life interactions and our early experiences in life shape and structure our personalities as much as our genes do. So it's a relationship between heritability, between epigenetics, between genes and environment. Environment dictates how we live our life, our experiences in life, and genes is the genes we, get, we inherit from our parents. Epigenetics describes an idea where the experiences in our life actually change the genetic sequence that we've inherited from our parents. And the idea of epigenetics is that it changes the expression of DNA and not the actual DNA. So in recent studies, mental health experts started to focus on the idea of epigenetics. And we found out that early childhood experiences, early adversity in childhood actually changes, an epigenetic signal changes the DNA of children. And what we found out is that early childhood adversity, like density, housing problems, noise, and violence, and poverty, and war, actually change the DNA of kids into creating a more inflamed state into adulthood, and creating addiction portfolios into adulthood, and of course, creating personality disorders. So that is a monumental link, linking childhood, genetics, and adult development. But it's not just in that sense, the sense where 
the actual epigenetic changes that happen through early childhood adversity not, don't only just change the genetic sequence or the genetic expression of the sequence, but they also change the structure of the brain. In the graph behind me, you can see how three different levels of the brain volume, the volume of the brain change when the income of the family changes. And in the lowest graph, you can see how the low social economical standards or poor families, children suffer with lower brain volume, which is an uh, emotional concept or a scary concept because now we see how poverty can really affect the brain structures of children as they grow up and as they develop. So that is one way that how biology can reshape our understanding of mental health diseases. The fourth concept of how science or biology, when you learn it, it can reshape how you feel about your own mental health is the gut flora, or the bacteria living in our digestive system. Now, to make it easy, we already know that the brain connection between, the, the connection between our brain and our guts is very evident. Actually, we have a nervous system called the enteric nervous system, and it's a whole system of 500 million nerve fibers connecting the brain with the gut. Now, we already knew that, but for some reason, we've excluded the bacteria living inside those uh, inside our gut. And in, uh, in, in long, long ago, we excluded those bacteria because we thought that they had no impact on the brain because the brain had the uh, blood-brain barrier and it would not allow substances to go in. But recent studies had found out that these bacteria actually are changing the permeability of the blood-brain barrier and interacting with your brain. Now, for you, an interesting fact, for every human cell you have in your body, there is a bacteria living inside you. So you have as much bacteria living inside you as much as there are cells that compromise you. Now that's a fascinating concept. Now the whole interesting research or the whole idea of being interested in gut flora and the effects of bacteria on our mental health started in the early 2000s in Kyushu University in Japan. So what they did basically back then is do a study between two different kinds of mice. The first kind of mice is called germ-free mice. These are mice that have been born through cesarean section and have been incubated ever since they were born. And ever since their incubation, that means that these, these mice have no bacteria in their body because they're born in cesarean section and they have been incubated. And on the other side, we have mice that we have specifically introduced certain bacteria, certain cultures inside their digestive system. Now, the shocking truth is that the, the mice without the bacteria were suffering with much higher stress levels than the mice with the bacteria. So that was the first revelation that the bacteria in the, in the digestive system of the mice was actually shaping and structuring the way these mice were behaving. And in the image behind me, you can see how those bacteria inside the digestive tracts of the mice were discovered to release really powerful neurochemicals. Chemicals such as DOPAC and such as BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor, and DOPAC, which is a derivative of the neurotransmitter dopamine, these bacteria are able to release these really powerful neuromessaging chemicals and that these messaging chemicals alter the behavior of the mouse and change the way the, how the mouse behaves. And in later on research, they actually transplanted some of the bacteria from the mice that had um, specific pathogen mice and introduced it in the germ-free mice and suddenly the mice started changing their behaviors. And that's a fascinating concept to think about. Now, all of the, what I've told you about has only been research tried on mice, but never on humans. But recently, there was a huge and beautiful study, and it was the first study to really study the bacterial colonies and the effects of bacteria on mental health in humans. And in this research, 1,054 individuals were enrolled into the study, and what they found out across the board from the study, that all the people that were suffering from depression in this study, all of them consistently showed lower levels of these two pathogens mentioned above, the corpococcus in general. So there is a beautiful and powerful link between depression and the bacteria in your digestive system. And that's also a fascinating way to change the way we look at mental health. This study makes us think of how food is important and what kind of things we put into our body shape and the structure and relationship of the bacteria we have inside us and our brain. Now, the final point of biology, an idea that if you knew about, it would also reshape your understanding of mental health as well.
One of the most exciting studies Harvard University did from the Adult Development Center through Dr. Robert Waldinger is that they studied over 750 people, almost 268 Harvard graduates and 456 people living in poorer areas, youth living in poorer areas. This study spanned for 75 years. That is one of the longest researches ever made in human history. And actually, John F. Kennedy, one of the American presidents, was part of this study. So what they did in this study is basically follow these young group of men living in Boston and track them to deep into their adulthood. And we carried and we, uh, they measured all sorts of information, their height, their length, their salaries, where they lived, how they lived, their relationships with their wives, what they ate, their cholesterol level, their blood pressure, all sorts of data and huge amounts of data were collected on these kids growing up into adulthood. Now, after all the data was collected, the researchers wanted to found, find out what was the single most important thing that decides happiness and health in life. Was it your cholesterol level? Was it your money? Or was it your financial situation? What, they wanted to search through these endless uh, data portfolio. What was the single thing that made people really happy and healthy? And after 75 years of research, Dr. Uh, Robert Van Gilder describes the, the, the whole research by summing it into one sentence. And he says, good relationships keep us healthier and happier, period. In this research, the, the real impact of social relationships on mental health was proven and was shown to be one of the most important factors in our development. Now, in the research behind me, you can see that it's not just about deep and depth and, uh, deep and deepened relationships, but it's also about social support. In this experiment, London School of Economics did a research on volunteering, and they found out that when you volunteer, you are more likely to feel happy 7%, and if you volunteer every week, you are more likely to feel very happy 16%. Volunteering actually changed the mental health portfolio of these old men. But this was not just on older people. When we've done the research again, it affected younger people, middle-aged people, and children. It's apparently that volunteering, social support, communication, and having deep relationships within your community affects your mental health deeply. And this is evident in uh, one of the largest studies that were ever made in bullying. 170,000 people participated in this study only to prove that bullying actually is directly, directly linked and related to very poor outcome in mental health. So what I'm trying to say globally is that if we are able to look at biology, we are able to look at science and allow science to inform us, to inform the way we see mental health, that that in itself could be a revolution we have in our personal lives. When we understand mental health in that way, we can begin to have deeper understanding to our nature and begin to have deeper understanding to society and to the community at large. What I want to finish with is that when you reshape your understanding of your mental health, you might experience a revolution or a change in your world. But if society was to reshape its understanding of mental health, if all of us as a people, as a community, as a planet, were to reshape how we see mental health, then I assume that the entire world itself and in itself will change. Thank you.